Hello everyone and welcome to the Henry Schein webinar series on COVID-19 on YouTube. I'm Dr. Gary Severance. It's my pleasure to welcome Dr. David Resnick back this week. The CDC came out with new interim guidelines late last week and we've asked Dr. Resnick to spend the time reviewing those guidelines and giving insight into what it means for dentists and dental professionals going back to practice. Dr. Resnick? Thank you, Gary, and as always, it is an honor and privilege to be with you today. Today we're going to talk about a pretty serious topic, uh, something we've been waiting for, the interim infection prevention and control guidance in dental settings during the COVID-19 response, and this guidance, this interim guidance, is from Atlanta-based Center for Disease Control, so these are the U.S. guidance. Um, so we're going to go right into it today and talk about some of the key points, and then we'll get into the weeds. We'll talk about some of the detail, because again, like always, the whole goal is how can we, in whatever stage of opening our practice, or we are open, or we're planning to open, whatever stage on that path you're on, how can we make sure that we continue to provide the safest dental visit for our patients, for their families, for our staff, for their families and for our families. So the whole goal is just around the safest dental visit. Some of the key points. As we all know, dental settings have some unique characteristics that warrant specific infection control considerations. I think that goes without saying. We've been dealing with issues surrounding aerosol generating procedures since the beginning of COVID and we still are. Prior prioritize the most critical dental services and provide care in a way that minimizes harm. Remember, our, one of our first goals is to do no harm. Um, and we don't want to delay care and harm people and have potential exposure. So one, if we delay care too long, we could cause problems for our patients, but we also don't want to expose our staff. So we've been in this sort of catch-22 for a while, and the guidance that we're going to go over today is going to help us sort of get past that. A key is communication. If, if I had one area that I think I would really truly want to stress that doesn't involve equipment, that doesn't involve masks, that doesn't involve techniques, it's communication. And this is communication between uh, staff members. This is communication with our patients. We really need to make sure that everyone stays as informed as possible. I can't stress that enough. And one of the things that we need to communicate, and it's very difficult, is if a staff member or a patient doesn't feel good, they need to stay home. Um, I've worked in, in public health for quite some time at this point, and I can honestly say I've seen staff for years come in when they're not feeling good, and we have to mask them up because I don't want to miss a paycheck or, or for whatever the reasons are. And so at, at this point, we really want people, if they are sick, to stay home. That is uh, really important. We want to know the steps to take if, if someone comes to your facility and they have symptoms. And so what do you do with the patients that may present? So these new recommendations are the next step. This is for resuming non-emergency dental care. And as I said, I know some of you are already there. Some of you are on your way there. Uh, as I said, there is a whole pathway in our country. And, and we'll sort of discuss why different people are at different uh, stages um, based on location and based on epidemic uh, uh, epidemiology. We're going to talk a little bit about some new information regarding facility and equipment considerations, um, sterilization and disinfection, and a little bit for the use of test-based strategies to inform patient care. I'm going to make a point now. A, there is not a reliable point-of-care test for COVID at this point. So, doesn't mean that we won't have one, and it doesn't mean there might not be a use for it. Right now, we just don't have a point-of-care test. Our most sensitive tests, which we covered a few weeks ago, are blood draws, where they're about 100% sensitive and 100% specific. And we're going to expand recommendations for the provision of dental care to both patients with and patients without COVID-19. So, as we know about transmission, it's thought to be spread primarily through respiratory droplets when an infected person coughs, sneezes, talks, or as we discussed in the past, sings in a choir. Airborne transmission from person to person over long distances is unlikely, and that's good to know. That's why you keep on hearing about this six-feet barrier. However, 
COVID-19 is a new disease, and we're still learning about how it spreads and the severity of illness it causes. We're looking at issues such as a, a cytokine storm causing inflammation. We're looking at these microclots. We're looking at how this impacts different parts of the body, and it's also very new. And although we really don't have any documented cases of, of transmission of COVID-19 to a dental health care personnel at this point, uh, we have to take every step to make sure it doesn't, and we have to watch things as they move forward. We do know that this uh, that uh, COVID-19 lives in an aerosol for hours, and for some services it can live for days, and, and I'm not going to understate uh, uh, how important I still believe it is to make sure that you wipe down all of your services, especially in your waiting areas where you didn't normally do it before COVID as many times as we're doing it now. Please do that. Um, even though uh, the CDC recently came out with some recommendations saying touching something and then touching your face is not a very likely mechanism of transmission. We do know that it can live on surfaces. You can have it on your hands. And as we've all noticed, keeping your hands away from your face is a challenge. So let's just um, watch that. And we also know that there are a lot of people who don't have symptoms. They may be asymptomatic or they may be pre-symptomatic and they can very much spread this disease. So since we all know that we're in a high-risk profession, the highest risk profession, um, we have visible spray that contains droplets and water, saliva, blood, and microorganisms and other debris. Surgical masks, and we've talked a lot about masks, protect mucous membranes of the mouth and nose from droplet splatter. Not from aerosol, but from droplet. They do not provide complete protection against inhalation of airborne infectious agents. But depending on the level, they're great fluid barriers. So, as I just brief, briefly mentioned, we don't have any data at this point, and I hope we really don't have any data, to assess the risk of SARS-CoV transmission during the dental practice. The goal is if we all take the steps we need to take over the next several months or however long this lasts, that we won't have any transmission. That's our goal. But we do know that healthcare workers in hospitals and long-term care facilities have shown some significant clusters. There's some resources there, and I think if we've watched the news lately, we're somewhat familiar with it. Again, stay informed and talk to them to see what your state health department is doing. I know in my home state, we get a daily update on the number of cases, the number of hospitalizations, and the number of, regretfully, the number of people who passed away. In my hospital, I literally get a daily count of the number of people who are in hospital, who might be in ICU, who might have some symptoms. And it's really important, and you can watch the trend, and, 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 and we're blessed in Atlanta, our trend is going down, and that's been a blessing, and let's hope it stays that way. So monitor the trends of local case counts, because it's going to be different if in, your, in New York City than if you are in um, a small town in Montana. It's going to be different if you're in New Jersey, where there's been problems with outbreaks, and if you're in an area that has not been impacted. So realize, know your own epidemic. It is going to impact how we provide care. But we still have to provide universal source control and actively screen symptoms and take temperatures on our patients who, and, our, and our people that come with our patients into our dental facilities. Ensure you have the uh, right amount of PPE and the right types of PPE to support your patient volume. Um, you don't want to open up and not have enough or one of your mess or one of your respirators gets soiled and you're out of luck. So if your PPE and your supplies are limited, use do the right thing and prioritize dental care for the, those in the highest need. And try to take care of your most vulnerable patients first. Uh, that, that is our philosophy here and something that uh, we've done for the last um, several decades. If your community is experience limited or no transmission or minimal community spread, dental care can be provided to patients without suspected or confirmed COVID-19 using strict adherence to standard precautions. However, given that patients may be able to spread this virus while asymptomatic, that it's recommended that dental health care personnel practice enhanced infection control whenever possible. So I, in my mind, 
we set up universal then standard precautions, we assumed that everybody we would see would um, have a bloodborne pathogen, realizing it was a very small percentage of the population. That's where we got from uh, the old wet finger gloves to some gloves to universal precautions to standard precautions. Um, it was interesting to note in the CDC guidelines, they do not really talk about transmission-based precautions. I, I found that to be interesting. What they did was strict adherence to uh, standard precautions, and in this scenario, use enhanced infection control. And what they're meeting is an N95 or greater. And I think that's uh, what we need to pay attention to. So even if we're in an area with minimal or no uh, cases at that point, I think the safety of yourself and the safety of your staff and the safety of your patients should always be the priority. But you might be opened up faster, and that's a good thing. So no to minimal community transmission is defined as evidence of isolated cases or limited community transmission, case investigations underway, no evidence of exposure in large communal settings. If your communities experience minimal to moderate or substantial transmission, then things are a little bit different. We can provide care. We have been providing emergency care. Now we're opening up to non-emergent care, but we, used to have, we have to take into consideration safety again of our patients and staff, and so therefore uh, we need to take our infection control and our personal protective equipment up a level. And mineral to moderate community transmission is defined as sustained transmission with a high likelihood or confirmed exposure within communal settings and potential for rapid increase in cases. Substantial community transmission is defined as a large-scale community transmission, including communal settings such as schools or workplaces. So, again, back to communication. Let's talk about some patient management issues that, that are in, in the CDC's uh, interim guidelines. Contact all your patients, just like we were doing in the emergency setting, but now we have more patients coming in, so contact patients prior to dental visit. And do a telephone screening. This is a part of our new uh, administrative controls. Um, if possible, delay uh, and avoid non-emergent dental care if patient reports symptoms. If somebody says they're running a fever, you really don't want them to come into your office. So you're doing a telephone triage. You can use teledentistry options uh, as, as alternatives to in-office care. In, in some settings. Another thing that you want to communicate to your patients is we want to, our waiting rooms are not large in the, for the most part, and we want to limit the number of people that come with the patient to the office. So please inform um, your patients when you communicate with them, when you're asking about uh, uh, their symptoms and, and et cetera, uh, to please ask them to limit the number of people that they bring with them to the dental offices. And if they do bring somebody, let them know that they'll be requested to wear a face mask uh, and they'll undergo screening for a fever and symptoms. So that is something we do for all people that are coming into, into my program. Um, and the medical visits that I have had since this outbreak, every time I go, I get screened before I walk in the door. And so I think that's something that we need to do as well. We do want to make sure that when pe folks come into our offices, they have face masks. And, and uh, for one reason or another, um, wearing a face mask in public has become a tad controversial. However, this is our livelihood. This is what we do for a living. These are our family, our friends, our staff. Ask your patients politely to make sure they wear a ma uh, face mask uh, when they're coming in. Ask about the presence of fever or other symptoms. We did talk about that. To actively take a patient's temperature. You can use any of the different kinds. There's ears, there's the head um, scanners. There's different ways of looking for temperature. Um, and if the person doesn't have a fever and otherwise doesn't have symptoms uh, consistent with COVID-19, then you can provide uh, dental care as long as you have the appropriate engineering and administrative controls, these are CDC guidelines, work practices, and infection control considerations. So we're getting ready to go into what some of this stuff means. Another thing to communicate to your patients, which is really important, is they may be asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic when they're in your office for their procedure. 
possibly seating a crown, endo, etc. Whatever your procedure is, please have them, the patients know to call the, your office if they develop symptoms uh, or are diagnosed with COVID-19 within 14 days following the appointment. So this is a whole new thing we're asking our patients to do. So we have to sort of make it easy and give them a little bit of a reminder. Um, I know we're trying to eliminate paper, maybe a paper reminder, uh, but this is something when you're talking to your patients or when you're going over the phone with your patients, that this is something I would repeat and, and let them know that yes, we're treating you during this. We want to provide the best possible care and we want to have a two-way communication because that's how we're going to have our best outcomes. Facility consideration. So post visual alerts, signs and posters. When I came into work um, after the Memorial Day weekend, there are little foot spacers all over the building. It really is sort of interesting to see how people actually stay six feet apart. Um, and, it, and I thought it was, it was brilliant. Um, have visual alerts for hand hygiene, how and when. You know, we were real good at the beginning of this epidemic with our 20 seconds of washing our hands. And now I'm afraid we're doing the how fast can I sing happy birthday version of washing our hands. So hand hygiene is the number one way we prevent healthcare acquired infections. And it's also the best way to prevent us from getting something or us passing something along. So really make sure that you spend the 20 minutes, uh, 20 minutes, 20 seconds with your uh, hand hygiene. Uh, make sure that you have signs about respiratory etiquette and cough etiquette. Um, uh, you go into a local grocery store and you can find what not to do. And so I think it's important that we just reinforce. We're educating um, and have instructions on wearing a cloth face covering or face mask for source control. So we want everybody in, in, a, in a mask. You want to provide supplies for respiratory hygiene, so things as tissues, um, a, a trash can that's no touch, um, hand sanitizer with a minimum of 60% alcohol or more. Um, so there's whole things that we can do when people check in that will make sure that we're having a safe visit. Install physical barriers at reception areas. Our receptionists, our front desk staff are vulnerable. And so we were going with this open office concept, which was very welcoming and very warming and something, because as I've mentioned before, we're building a new clinic in, in this building that I was looking forward to having an open front desk and, and a more welcoming environment. And now we're looking to put barriers up again because of a new disease that has entered into the fray, which has actually impacted the design of the new clinic. So there's things that we need to do that we may not have considered before. In the waiting room, we've talked about this in the past, make sure that the chairs are at least six feet apart, which you know is going to greatly limit the number of people that you can hold in the waiting room. So some patients might come in, let you know they're there, and they'll wait out in their car. And you can text them to keep the waiting room from being overcrowded and, and a potential source of disease. Make sure that you remove toys, magazines, things that can't be wiped down, and wipe them down frequently, like I mentioned earlier today. We talked about the reception area. We talked about minimizing the number of people in the waiting room by asking them to stay home. Um, and then minimize overlapping dental appointments. And, and that's something we're struggling with here. I have eight operatories. I've been down for a couple months. How am I going to work it all in? So I literally have every member of the staff helping me design a pattern where we don't have overlapping appointments, but are still able to get some significant work done. Something that you really need to consider, many of, of the offices have been down or closed. And so dental equipment might require maintenance or might require repair. The most important thing to do is to use the manufacturer's instructions for use. When it comes to maintenance, when it comes to any act, any um, uh, information regarding the piece of equipment you have, the manufacturer's instructions for use are vitally important. And now you have uh, what to do when your office has been closed or for long periods of, of non-use. And then how do you make sure that your equipment is going to be safe, and especially your dental unit water lines, which you know we've had an issue with in the past. So the recommendations are to test your water quality to make sure it's less than the 500 CPU per ml. 
before expanding your dental services. Confer with a manufacturer regarding recommendations for need. Do we need to shock our dental unit water line? Um, and then also uh, continue standard maintenance for all of your uh, dental unit water lines according to the instructions for use of the dental operatory unit and the dental unit water line treatment products. So again, follow those manufacturer's instructions for use. I can't stress that enough. Don't try to do it on your own. Do what the instructions say to do. Ensure that all routine cleaning and maintenance has been performed according to schedule. Please make sure you test your autoclaves, your statums, um, using biological indicators, or if you use a service, please make sure before you reopen that you make sure your, your sterilizers are working. Um, and in our case, uh, we actually had somebody come out and take a look at our compressor vacuum and suction lines. Um, we have an annual radiography equipment um, scanning. And so far right now, everything else is fine. We're ready to go. Please make sure you're doing that, again, following the manufacturer's instruction for use. There are different kinds of controls that we look at. And these are, again, CDC recommendations. One is that we should limit clinical care to one patient at a time whenever possible. And that's proving to be a challenge for me. As I said, I have eight operatories. Um, we're going to start with delivery of, of some partials and dentures and, and things of that sort uh, before one of our piece of equipment gets here. But we had set it up where we're going to see more than one patient at a time. So I have to relook at that. Set up the operatory so that only the clean and sterile supplies and instruments that are needed for the procedure are, are there. And we have a, a long history of making sure things are easy to access, but now we are really going to have to basically put things away, know where they are, and just take out what you need for that procedure. Any supplies or equipment, like a box of gloves, that are exposed but not used during the procedure should be considered contaminated and should be disposed of or reprocessed properly after the completion of a procedure. I, at the beginning of this epidemic, I came to work and all of our gloves in the entire building that had been opened were gone. Um, infection control had come here. We did have a minor outbreak in the building at the beginning of the epidemic, and literally anything that was open, like a box of gloves that was sitting around um, that didn't couldn't be processed, was trashed. Avoid aerosol generating procedures whenever possible. So it, it, it's a bit of a contradiction that we want to open, but that we're looking at a way of doing it with avoiding the use of hand pieces and the air water syringe. And so it, they're literally looking for um, atraumatic technique kinds of things at this point. Um, I don't know how realistic that's going to be, so we're going to get the equipment we're needing to ensure that we have a, a safe environment. The use of the ultrasonic scaler is not recommended. Um, I have some concerns about that, but if I do everything in my power as the chief of service or, say, the owner of a practice to ensure that the dentist and the dental assistant are as healthy as possible, meaning I will have a portable filtration unit in the room placed appropriately. I will have um, extra oral aerosol evacuation systems in the room so to, to elimin eliminate any potential there is for transmission. If I do the same thing for my hygiene team, including making sure they have the availability of high volume evacuation, I don't know why we could not use it. However, I live in Atlanta, I follow the rules, and so we are going to limit or not use the high-speed ultrasonic scaler until we can have a real good conversation about it. And this isn't anything to do with uh, dentists and hygienists and any kind of disagreement that's going on. This is... A very similar conversation that I had uh, some time ago. Um, at the beginning of the HIV epidemic, if you looked at Esther Wilkins, who is the goddess of dental hygiene, if you looked at her text, it said, do not use the high-speed ultrasonic scaler if you are um, working on a patient with TB or HIV. 
and several of my colleagues and myself, we literally advocated for years to, for that to be removed because, as according to the CDC, we have no documentation of a bloodborne pathogen being transmitted via aerosol. However, we're in a new day, and we do have a pathogen that can possibly be, be uh, transmitted uh, versus aerosol, which is why the recommendation is strong. It is to not use the ultrasonic, and, and as I said, I've, I've fought to use the ultrasonic in the HIV days. At this point, I'm going to do what the CDC has recommended and have my hygienist not use the high-speed ultrasonic scaler until we're further on into this epidemic and until all of my equipment arises and testing their comfort level. I want to make sure that they're comfortable using it if at some point we decide to move forward. So again, remember, these are recommendations, and that's all that they are, but they're very important recommendations. So what I said, if I can summarize it, is I'm going to follow the instructions. I'm going to wait for my equipment. I'm going to see how we do on the doctor's side. We'll have some hand scale and some polishing on the hygiene side. And then if things move in an appropriate direction and the equipment is working as function and we have some great research that comes out on a, almost a daily basis, then we'll start our hygiene. That's how I'm going to look at it. If aerosol generating procedures are necessary for dental care, forehanded dentistry. I, I'm an older dentist. I can't do anything by myself at this point. I am very dependent on my dental assistant, like I'm sure many of us are. High volume evacuation and dental dams to minimize droplet spatter and aerosols. Limit the number of dental health care workers present during the procedure. Only those that are necessary for patient care. I run an, a, a residency program, and we'll have our new class in July, which I'm looking forward to. They're going to be in the rooms watching some procedures, but they will be in full armamentarium, full PPE, including N95 masks that have been fit tested. There has been no evidence about pre-procedural mouth rinses, according to the CDC. At one point, the ADA was recommending a 1.5% um, hydrogen peroxide dilution, something like peroxyl, um, but they haven't really um, studied a lot of this since we don't have a lot of data. We do know that, that chlorhexidine really isn't effective against uh, COVID, but it is effective against other microorganisms. So there's some pre-rinses that you can uh, look at to reduce the level of oral microorganisms in aerosol and splatter. Um, the only one that I'm aware of that has any kind of impact is, is uh, the peroxide product, but CDC did not list that, so again, I'll use that product, and then we'll see what the further research shows. Engineering controls, and I will say this is way past my pay grade. I literally have brought in people to help with this. Uh, I am not uh, an HVAC person, and now I understand why they get paid so much money. Ventilation systems that provide air movement from a clean to contaminated flow direction should be installed and properly maintained. So I had to make sure with getting help, again from our engineering, uh, to make sure that we were in the right direction. So consult an HVAC professional to uh, look at increasing filtration efficiency to the highest level compatible with the HVAC system you have without significant deviation from the airflow. Again, consult an HVAC professional, unless you happen to have one in the family, then consult a family member, to investigate the ability to safely increase the percentage of outdoor air supplied through this system. Uh, limit the use of demand controlled ventilation. Sort of what that means is you don't want the air conditioner turning off and on or the heater turning off and on. Um, and run bathroom exhaust fans continuously during business hours. Consider the use of portable HEPA air filtration unit while the patient is actively undergoing and immediately following aerosol generating procedures. Uh, the use of these units will reduce the particle count, including droplets in the room, and reduce the amount of turnover time for the room. I have bought a couple of these units at this point, and they are here. And so that's exciting. I have some of my devices here, and I'm looking forward. I'm actually purchased some more, so I'm waiting for the next batch to get here. 
um, place the HEPA unit within the vicinity of the patient's chair, but not behind the dental health care personnel. Ensure the dental health care personnel are not positioned between the unit and the patient's mouth. Um, position the unit to ensure that it's not pull air into or past the breathing zone of the dental health care worker. Consider the use of upper room ultraviolet germicidal irradiation as an adjunct or a UVC as an adjunct to higher uh, ventilation and cleaning air rates. So again, we're trying to clean the air. That is what this is about. We have a potential organism that can be transmitted versus aerosol. We know that with our older members of our uh, society and those with underlying conditions, it can be a very serious illness. I think at this point it's caused over 100,000 deaths in the United States. It's not time to play. It's time to take this seriously. Patient placement should be provided um, in individual patient rooms, and Lord knows I wish I would have had this information um, about six months ago when I designed uh, the new program. So we are taking steps. I, I have 12 operatories in the new program uh, we'll be moving to. Um, I have one that's a negative pressure room, which was because of this uh, uh, pandemic. I do have three walls in every room, but I have a 12 o'clock cabinet, so I won't be able to seal. So maybe what can I do? So what we have here for, for facilities like I have now with open floor plans to, to uh, prevent the spread of the pathogens, there should be at least six feet of space between patient chairs, physical barriers between patient chairs, easy to clean floor to ceiling barriers will enhance effectiveness of the portable HIPAA filtration units um, and make sure if you're placing something on the ceiling it doesn't get in the way of your sprinkler system um, for our uh, hospital accreditation programs and for FQHCs out there it would be a joint commission violation you don't want one of those and you want to make sure God forbid something happens that your program is safe. Operatory should be oriented parallel to the direction of airflow when possible. Again, that's the HVAC people going to help. Determine the maximum number of patients who can safely receive care at the same time. So this is different than the one at a time that we heard earlier based on the number of rooms. So I have eight rooms, at least two people, and since we're only doing deliveries of removable to start with, our goal was to have two come in at the beginning and then about 30 to 45 minutes later have the next two come in. And so we're really in different locations, so we're really trying to take advantage of the space. You need time allowed for the droplets to sufficiently fall from the air after a dental procedure. This is very important. Dental health care personnel should wait at least 15 minutes, or 15 minutes, which isn't all that much time, after the completion of dental treatment and departure of the patient to begin room cleaning and disinfection process. So what we would do is we'll have the dental assistant um, and uh, we'll have somebody floating because we won't have as many uh, patients as we normally would have at this point. The equipment, the, uh, the cassette will be taken to the sterilization area, but the room will sit. And the room will sit for at least 15 minutes and then we'll go uh, wipe it down, making sure again we follow the manufacturer's instructions for use on our wipes. How the wet time is really important there. Hand hygiene. We did talk about this, and and I won't tell you my age, but my hands look at least ten years older than the rest of me. But we and we've had this at the hospital forever, before and after all patient contact uh, contact with potentially infectious materials, before putting on and after removing personal protective equipment, including gloves. Um, using an alcohol-based hand rub with at least 60% alcohol or wash hands for that 20 seconds. Um, if hands are visibly soiled, you always use soap and water. You don't use a hand rub if your hands are visibly soiled. Um, please make sure that we have enough hand hygiene supplies available for all dental health care personnel in every care location. So we have um, alcohol-based hand rubs that are uh, over 60% throughout the program. We have hand washing sinks. Hand hygiene is one of the most important things that we do. 
For universal source control, dental health care personnel should wear a face mask at all times when they are in the dental setting. So I'm in my office right now with the door closed, which is why I don't have my face mask on, besides it would make for a really boring presentation. When available, surgical masks are prepared over cloth face coverings for dental health care personnel. Now, my favorite uh, football team, I have ordered um, some from my pro team. I'm still waiting for my cloth mask so I'm, uh, to come in, so I'm wearing the disposable paper mask at this point. Some dental health care personnel whose job duties don't require PPE, such as clerical personnel, may wear, continue to wear their cloth face mask um, while in the dental setting. If it's front desk people, make sure you have that barrier set up, you know, like a sneeze guard type of barrier. Uh, other dental health care personnel, dentists or dental hygienists, dental assistants, may wear the cloth face mask when they're not engaged in patient care. This is not something you want to wear in patient care. If you have a cloth face mask, please wash it daily in the hottest water possible. Too many people are wearing these face masks over and over again, and to be frankly honest, it, it's not very hygienic. Um... Dental health care personnel should remove their respirator or surgical mask and put on their cloth face covering or, again, a surgical mask when leaving the facility at the end of the shift. Um, it's very important that dental health care personnel be instructed that if they touch or adjust their face mask, their cloth mask, uh, or any of those uh, N95, um, they should perform hand hygiene immediately after. Really, uh, when you're taking your N95 off, remember you got it from the bottom first, you're grabbing it by the straps, and you're pulling it away from the face. There is no reason. The only reason to touch it is to make sure you have a seal. Dental health care personnel need to change face masks and coverings if they become soiled, damp, or hard to breathe through. I'm a mouth breather, so I have to change mine on a regularly frequent basis. Um, as I mentioned with a cloth face mask, please do that daily. Uh, hand hygiene is important, as we've talked about. And really, we need to provide training, and I will be doing that. I have been doing that ongoing, and today we're having a full-bore CDC guideline um, presentation that I'll personally give to the staff so any and all questions can be answered. We need to make sure that we have the appropriate PPE and provide it to our dental health care personnel, whether you're a dentist, a dental assistant, front desk personnel, dental hygienist. And then they must, under, they must receive training on and understanding of when to use PPE, what PPE is appropriate or necessary for whatever the procedures, how to properly don, use, and doff PPE in a manner to prevent self-contamination. Remember, during Ebola, we had people actually infecting themselves. This is not going to happen with, with COVID-19, um, God willing, but please do this in the proper sequence. Um, how to properly dispose of or disinfect and maintain your PPE, and then the limitations of PPE. So, for non-aerosol generating procedures, dental health care personnel should wear a surgical mask at the highest level, and the highest level of a surgical mask is level three. Eye protection, remember reading glasses or glasses are not considered um, eye protection, but protective eyewear with solid side shields are, or a full face shield, and that's what I recommend. A gown or protective clothing during procedures likely to generate splashing or splattering of blood and other body fluids. During aerosol generating procedures conducted on patients assumed to be non-contagious. So you're making an assumption, and my assumption is that all people are contagious and all people have something, but still consider the use of N95 respirator, or respirator offers a higher level of protection. So again, my recommendation would be if you are doing a non-aerosol generating procedure, I'm still going to have on N95s, and I'm still going to have my staff in N95s, but a surgical mask is fine. And I want to get that point across. During any kind of aerosol generating procedures that will happen in my program, all staff that are involved in that procedure will have on N95 or better. And one that has been fit tested, or at least initially fit tested. During aerosol generating procedures conducted on patients assumed to be non-contagious, 
consider the use of an N95. Remember, my thoughts on that are a little bit more, use an N95 or something that is a little bit higher. Respirators should be used in the context of a respiratory protection program. And this, everything we're sort of talking about today is a respiratory protection program. So you're doing medical evaluations on the phone, you're screening people when they come into your office, you're having all your hand hygiene things available, you're trained your staff on proper PPE, you've had your staff initially fit tested, annual fit testing has been relaxed for a period of time on their N95s, they know how to wear them and how to store them and how to use them properly and not write on them. If a respirator is not available for aerosol generating procedures, or if you have staff that are having a hard time with N95s, um, there is a recommendation you can use a surgical mask and a full face shield. I have a staff member who is asthmatic, who cannot wear the N95s, and so it's either wearing a level 3 in full face shield or a papper. And so at this point, we're going to use the level 3 and the face shield. So the highest level, remember we talked about that, so level 1 is the least, level 3 is the highest level, and it's fluid protection. But we're hoping that between the fluid and physical protection of the level 3 mask plus the full face shield, the staff people will be protected. If a surgical mask and a full face shield are not available, please don't do any aerosol generating procedures. You're putting yourself, your entire program at risk. Donning and doffing, we've talked about this before. I'm really not going to go over it very much again, other to say, notice the number of times that hand hygiene shows up on donning. It's on there twice. On doffing, you see it on there at least twice. Uh, again, it shows you some uh, interesting things on this slide on how you remove the N95 mask and how you also remove a surgical mask. And again, hand hygiene. Number one way we prevent hospital acquired infections or healthcare acquired infections. We're gonna look at different ways that we have to optimize strategy to, to ensure that we have enough PPE once we get going on, on hand. So you sort of need to understand your inventory and where the supply chain is. I know there's a great deal of frustration because it's been very difficult um, out of the hospital environment getting N95s. And then we have issues with some of the KN95s um, being pulled by FDA. It's really important that you, uh, that you use the equivalents if they are approved. Um, and and um, that's something that I think that we really need to stress. You also understand your burn rate. How fast are you going through PPE? Um, you also have, need to have an idea of where the epidemic is in your community. Um, if you have had your engineering administrative controls, that's good. Um, and we have to make sure that we educate and train staff. And that means everybody from the doctorate level to the lowest education, it doesn't matter. Every member of the dental team is equally important in my eyes, and that's been my philosophy. Whether you are the front desk scheduler, which to me has the hardest job because people want to get in yesterday and it's not so easy these days, or you are a dental assistant, having to be my dental assistant, you've got your hands full, or you are a staff dentist or the chief. Everybody is equally important. No one is more important than anyone else. So there are some optimization strategies. And NIOSH has a PPE tracker. Um, and there's even a personal protective equipment burn rate calculator. I want to thank Dr. Severance for sharing those uh, with me. You can look at your conventional capacity uh, measures consisting of engineering, administrative, and PPE controls that should already be implemented in general infection prevention and control plans in healthcare settings. Your contingency capacity measures that may be used temporarily during periods of expected PPE shortages, and that's something that we have to look at as we open and move further down the road. And crisis capacity, we have been in a crisis, let's be honest. Strategies that are not commensurate with U.S. standards of care, but may need to be considered during periods of known PPE shortage, such as reprocessing N95s, reusing N95s, some of the things that we're doing these days. But figuring out how to optimize and keep your costs down while providing the best service, that's what these tools will help you do. So some of the things you can do, if you get your hands on some N95s and you know where they're coming from, I've never been, well, I am a hoarder of dental equipment, I hate to admit, 
or your N95 respirators. Make sure that you can get as many as you can. Uh, make sure that you have the ability to decontaminate or use filtering face piece respirators. There are some portable units out there. I don't have the information to say whether they're good or they're not. Um, that's something you would talk to a sales rep or a manufacturer's rep. Um, you need to consider different factors when looking at uh, getting respirators from a different country. As I previously mentioned, there have been some issues with some of the KN95 respirators, some of the Chinese respirators. There are some good ones, but the number of companies out there is, is smaller and it keeps on getting reduced. Um, and then make sure you calculate your burn rate on how fast you're going through it and monitor and manage your staff. Screen all dental health care personnel. So when we come to work, um, when I come to work, uh, I get my temperature taken every day. If I have to go, now I'm off campus, if I go to the main hospital, I get my temperature taken when I walk into the building. And so I highly suggest you manage your staff and have them get their temperature tested at the beginning of a shift and make sure that they don't have any fever or symptoms consistent with COVID-19. Many people have been out of work um, and they're getting themselves back into work. And, and I'm a, I really am I'm, I'm a little bit fearful of people who don't feel well showing up in, to work because... As a part of routine practice, dental health care personnel should be asked to regularly monitor themselves for fever and symptoms consistent with COVID-19. Implement sick leave policies for dental health care personnel that are flexible, non-punitive, and consistent with public health guidance. And that's going to be a challenge, but that's what we have to do. We have to admit, implement sick leave policies that are flexible. We don't want people coming to work sick. We have to do some education and training on preventing transmission of infectious agents, including refreshing training. Ensure that all members of the team are educated, trained, and have practiced appropriate use of PPE prior to caring for a patient. So we already have had our rehearsals here. I think I mentioned quite some time ago, watching my medical colleagues put on their PPE for the first time. If I would have filmed it, it would have been sort of like a comedy show. But now we're actually watching our staff do things different, with, so we know that there are challenges. So please make sure your staff can demonstrate that they're doing things properly before you take care of a patient. And there are some guidelines here I put on the slide for training on PPE and then um, healthcare respiratory protection resource training. I want to thank you for your time and attention. I know today's been a little bit longer than usual. I wanted to go through the guidelines, give you a general overview, um, and then go a little bit into the weeds to discuss some of what they were saying. Remember, I think the bottom line is that we want to get our practices moving. We want to do it in the safest possible way. We do realize this. There are differences in the country based on region, based on where the epidemic is. We know there are differences based on city. So it's really important that you look and see where this pandemic is in your world and then still take all the steps necessarily to ensure that you provide safe and professional and courteous and friendly and loving care during this time of crisis. Again, thank you for your time and attention. Uh, back to you, Gary. Thank you, Dr. Resnick, for reviewing that for us. Now, I know we had some technical difficulties on last Friday's webinar. It started a little late. Plus, it was a holiday weekend for many of you. So if you haven't had a chance, go back and watch the video featuring Dr. David Resnick and Lee Culp. Lee Culp's a dental technician and also the CEO of Sculpture Studios. And he shared some novel techniques and workflows that would help you work with your laboratory safer and better and more efficiently. Also, remember the CDC did mention HEPA filters and UVGI in this interim guidance. If you're not necessarily aware of what's available, you can go back to our air management webinar series as well. And again, if you have any questions, comments, or ideas for future episodes, please let us know by emailing us at webinars at henryshine.com and subscribe to our YouTube page by clicking the button below. Again, until we see you again, stay safe and stay informed.